The only people who don't want to disclose the truth are people with something to hide. This is True News for Tuesday, June 14, 2011. Welcome to the program. I'm Rick Walls. The American people have a serious crisis on their hands that they must confront, no matter how unpleasant and messy. And there is an imposter in the White House. And if he were merely a member of the Senate or the House, uh, this would not be a life and death issue for the Republic. Barack Obama, however, sits in the most powerful chair in the world, the presidency of the United States of America. He has fundamentally changed the structure of our society by appointing Marxists and communists to key government jobs, by seizing control of vast portions of private enterprise, including the automobile industry, health care, banking and finance, and student loans. He is remaking America to conform to his socialist image, and we may never recover as a nation. Furthermore, he is appointing known radicals to judicial posts, including the Supreme Court. He is bankrupting the coal industry, as he promised, with new fees. He has shut down the domestic oil drilling industry, yet funded with tax dollars an oil drilling operation in Brazil. He has run up America's debt into the trillions of dollars with no end in sight. He mocks Americans who were born here, who want our borders secured. He's ordered the U.S. military to accept homosexuality, and he is pushing gay marriage onto the nation. He is perverse and wicked and dangerous to the republic. There is a growing mountain of evidence that Barack Obama is not the man he claims to be. In fact, I'm not sure if even Barack Obama knows his true identity. He is a man without a past. His past was manufactured for him. The stories that he tells about his childhood and youth are lies. We clearly know that he is not a natural-born American citizen. Even if he were born in Hawaii, as he claims, he is not a natural-born American citizen. How do we know? By his own admission, through the, le- through the release of his phony birth certificate, he admits that his father was born in Kenya, Africa. His father was a British subject at the time, thus a subject to the Queen of England. A natural-born citizen means that both of his parents were American citizens. That fact alone disqualifies him from being the president. Several private investigators have come forward on this radio program with convincing evidence that Obama has fraudulently used a Social Security number issued in Connecticut. Obama's fake Social Security number is 042-684425. Social Security databases clearly show that the number was issued to a person born in 1890. Some people claim that person was a Mr. Jean-Paul Ludwig, a man born in France in 1890 who immigrated to the USA in 1924, lived many years in Connecticut, and retired in Hawaii where he died. We also know that a mysterious Harrison J. Bonnell shares Obama's address on Greenwood Avenue in Chicago and shares his fake Social Security number. Likewise, we know that Obama does not own the house but claims the property taxes on his federal IRS 1040 form. Yet the Cook County Tax Collector's Office lists Obama's CPA, Harvey Weinberg, as the person who pays the taxes. As I've pointed out, Mr. Weinberg has a long history of association with a communist front organization in Chicago. When Dr. Jerry Corsi's book was to be released, and at the same time that Donald Trump was making world headlines questioning Obama's birth. The White House suddenly posted a digital image of a Hawaii birth certificate on the government website. But within hours, many young people skilled in computer digital graphics 
quickly dissected the image as a fake, showing that it was a composite of multiple digital images put together to form a birth certificate that looks legitimate. And there's the forged Selective Service Military Draft Registration Form, too. Furthermore, we have investigative journalist Jack Cashel's claim that Obama did not write his autobiography, Dreams from My Father. He maintains that communist revolutionary Bill, Bill Ayers wrote the book. By the way, Jack Cashel will be my guest on Wednesday. Despite the overwhelming evidence that Obama is a fraud, a criminal, officialdom in Washington cowardly ignores the truth. Both Democrats and Republicans in the Congress are unwilling or afraid to confront it. Likewise, the FBI, the Justice Department, the Social Security Administration, the Secret Service, federal prosecutors, federal judges, and intelligence agencies are shamefully negligent in their constitutional and legal duty to investigate these accusations. If the accusers are wrong, let the evidence come forth to prove it. Obama could not have made it to the White House and stayed there this long with his fake ID documents without the assistance of high-level people in the U.S. federal government. That, my friend, is the scariest thing in this matter. It means we have a criminal syndicate in control of our national government. Now, True News will continue our relentless pursuit of the truth. We are not afraid. Truth shall always prevail over lies. Today, we will show you the evidence that Obama's birth certificate is a forgery. If his name wasn't Barack Obama, he'd be in prison for identity theft, forgery, and making false statements to government agencies. My guest today is Mr. Paul Irie. He has 50 years' experience as a typographer. He is an expert in typefaces. In 1967, he started Bergen Graphics in Fort Lee, New Jersey. He had 60 employees working three shifts per day, producing printed graphic advertising materials, such as the weekly product sales circulars that appeared in newspapers every week for big national clients, such as Montgomery Ward and Acme Supermarket Chain. He was a pioneer in photo topography and was, well, and was one of the first graphic arts companies to own a Macintosh computer and to use Adobe software. What I'm saying is that this is a man who is an expert. Whoever forged Obama's birth certificate is a young person who is an expert in using computer software to manipulate digital images. Computers and software did not exist in 1961 when Obama was born, certainly not used freely and openly in government agencies at that time. They used old-fashioned manual typewriters. And that, my friend, is where any police detective like Colombo could easily get a conviction in court against a slick street hustler like Obama. They made a big mistake, and it's time to get caught in the lie. And when they get caught, the lid will fly off and expose the rest of the worms who have aided and abetted this liar and con man. Now, Mr. Paul Irie is on the telephone to share with us what he told Dr. Jerome Corsi at WorldNet Daily about what he found when he closely examined Obama's digital image of his birth certificate on the White House website. Mr. Irie, welcome to True News. Let's start uh, with you telling our audience your professional background. Go ahead. All right. In 1955, I joined the Air Force. By uh, Within four months, five months, they had put me into... Uh, personnel training over at Scott Air Force Base in Illinois. And I was first sent to uh, Labrador, and I'm typing. So typing was what I did all day on, a, on the old-fashioned typewriters. I think it was an Underwood. 
and I did that until I was discharged at the end of 1958. Then I went to work for an ad agency, William Camp Company in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and uh, December 1959, I came to New York City to work for Hearst Publishing on their American Druggist magazine, where I made up the dummies for the magazine. And after that, I did a variety of stints in uh, ad agencies like Friendries Advertising, got a job down in Puerto Rico, United Promoters and Advertisers for a while. They did a lot of their own stuff because there weren't good services down there, so I got into stats and making my own type. But I basically was uh, an artist doing paste up until 1967. My wife and I opened our own company, Bergen Graphics. We were very successful there. We did a lot of uh, retail advertising accounts. I did Montgomery Ward, their nationwide catalogs and their weekly ads for all their soft goods, their clothing line. And I did that account for 10 years. Acme Markets for the East Coast, we did 60 ads a week distributed around the East Coast. We had uh, 60 employees finally. By uh, the 70s, we had moved down to uh, North Bergen, and then later on the Hudson River across the street, across from Miami, I mean from uh, New York, where we had VIP typesetters. I was considered a pioneer in photo typesetting. <clears throat> My uh, company hosted the Daily News. Uh, they come over with about a dozen people and went through our plant and I described our processes because they wanted to get out of hot metal. That's why we wound up doing a Mergenthaler account. They wanted to get out of hot metal. They had a warehouse full of metal. They wanted to unload it and go to film and store film for all their previous work. So we were doing quite well with the 60 people, three shifts. We had everything under one roof. They posted my brochure, the company brochure, on the World Net, Net Daily article. And we did, did quite well. And eventually, uh, I had an office in uh, also Manhattan. So we had a branch office there. My experience, though, then what became mostly about producing the typography, getting into phototype was a new field. So I acquired a lot of expertise recognizing typefaces. We were considered a typesetting company to some, that we'd provide typesetting services in the new mode at the time because everybody was leaving hot metal and getting into phototype. And I didn't deal much with hot metal. Mostly I dealt with phototype. So um, my experience is strong in that area. And later, by the mid-80s, the company had closed, and I started another company, and we were doing Macintosh. We started, I was an early user of Macintosh. In 85, I bought a Mac Plus and kept upgrading, and I'm still Macintosh. So computers, I'm very familiar with. I could say that a typist, though, just with experience in using a typewriter, should have or could have discovered what I discovered. I feel that what I've discovered is, well, like Corsi called it, the smoking gun. There's other people that have found considerable evidence that the birth certificate is a forgery. I went looking into it. It was released on April 27th. And I studied it, and until about the middle of May, I think it was the 17th, I blew up the word student on my Macintosh, quite large, looking for problems. And suddenly I saw that the two lowercase t's in student were from a different style. Now, Paul, when, you say, when you say you blew up the word student, you're talking about... The Enlarging word, it on a screen. You're talking, yeah, but I'm talking. I know, but, but I'm. You're talking about 
uh, on the digital image that's on the White House website. Yeah, they released the digital image. That's all I had. It really wasn't adequate because it, uh, it had the safety paper background, which confused everything. And it had been scanned by an OCR scanning system, which blotched up the letters quite a bit. The OCR system converts grayscale to bitmap. And in the process of doing that, the, the letters, what were originally typewritten letters, turned into unrecognizable blobs that were indeed, though, recognizable for an OCR machine. There was really no reason to do that. They should have used a standard scanning software on a standard computer scanners. I'm also very familiar with computer scanners. I had one of the first for a personal computer, a $10,000 Nikon scanner, scanned 35 millimeter film at up to 6,000 dots per inch. Uh, but now I just use a, a desktop uh, scanner. I've got two mm -hmm. on my desktop. So, so, so you, you blew up your Macintosh. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was released was digital, of course, but the Associated Press really helped me released a version of the birth certificate that they were given copies of at the press conference. At the White House press conference, they handed out copies of the copy that they got brought to them from the Honolulu Health Department. Honolulu Health Department had pulled out their binder, allegedly, put it face down on the copy machine, which is not a scanner, and made a uh, reasonable copy of that document, which would have been, hopefully, in the health department, a uh, very sharp, reliable, near-perfect copy of what was in their files that was typed in 1961 on a standard typewriter, we assume. Knowing all that, when I saw the Associated Press release, I was getting approximately uh, a ca typewriter cap was resolved with about 20 pixels high. So that was a good image. And I was able to take that in Photoshop, drop up the faint blue background that existed on the uh, online release of uh, the Associated Press version and clean it up and make it sharp enough, I could clearly see the typewriter text. You couldn't see that on the, uh, well, not the way I, I, the PDF document released from the White House, if properly, I've learned since, if properly uh, opened up in TIFF, will give you a much sharper image. But I didn't know that. But anyway, I was working with the uh, Associated Press version, which, by the way, is no longer being released. So nobody can replicate what I did the way I did it and might say, well, this is a fraud, Mr. Ivey, because uh, we can't get sharp enough material to make these kind of decisions. And I can understand why forensic document examiners never really looked at this. I mean, they looked at it, but they said, wow, this is so bitmapped. How could we ever decide anything at least about the type? So people... Paul, we're we're losing you there on your on your I think on your cell phone there. Um, hang on a second. Are you? Can you hear me? Hey, Paul, can you hear me? Uh, Paul, hey, Paul, we lost you there on your cell phone. You you faded away. Oh, there. it's my portable phone. If you call my cell phone, it's another number. Oh, okay. Well, okay. Well, now you're back loud and clear. Okay. We really? lost you, we lost you there for about thirty seconds. So gee, nothing changed. I'm just okay. All right. Well, walking around. Well, we have. You know, I'm sure we have. Um, um, you know, those okay, as long as you're getting me clear, then I'll continue. Yes, sir. Go ahead. So uh, let's go back. You blew up the, the word student, and the word student was was typed Had in two the... two different keys. Yeah, but it was typed in the box for the uh, occupation of the mother, right? Is of that... the mother, that's mm -hmm. correct. But the one word had keys from a different style, recognizable different style of typeface design. I also design typefaces and understand that process. And when I saw that, I just said to myself, bingo, this can't be real. And now let's look at it. So I started examining the whole uh, document with that in mind. How do the letters match each other? Meaning, 
I've got a lowercase e that is obviously a different design, a different typeface design from the rest of them on the document. The It's hard to describe. We're doing radio here, not TV, or I want to put things up on a screen. But a lowercase e, everybody knows, has a horizontal bar across the middle of it, in the middle of a circle, it's open in the lower three quarters. And the E's are like that on the document, except for one. One E is of the design you commonly see where the horizontal bar isn't horizontal perfectly, it's tilted, where the left side joins lower within the circle and the right side is higher. I show that example and my evidence saying, look, amongst all the other two-letter examples, I presented this as a evidence with two-letter examples to show that these two letters, although they came from the birth certificate, do not match each other for style. Bloggers and commenters that are seeing this story dispute that and say, well, Mr. Irie, this is also low, re low resolution, you can't tell that, but you can. And I say as a typographer, I definitely can. I've seen type reproduce every way you can imagine through multiple copies and, and, and going into computer scan, being scanned again, it doesn't matter. When the, when the horizontal bar is no longer horizontal on the E and the circle stays put and doesn't appear to be distorted, but the horizontal bar becomes an angled bar, that's a different design of type and was done on typewriters in the era. And in that case, how could we have examples like we have in the word student within the same word, different type styles on the document? And I had to think that through. What happened here? At first, I didn't realize what I had but I walked it through in my brain and I said, well, if I'm a forger, first of all, I better work in the Hawaii Department of Health. I better have access to all the birth certificates of that era because I'm going to say to myself, if I'm going to forge a birth certificate for Barack Obama, I've got to match the type styles exactly of 1961. Ah, but this is... 2011, those typewriters are thrown away a long time ago. And anyway, I don't dare buy a typewriter of the era and throw a blank form in and start typing. This is how kidnappers get caught. They type the ransom note on their own typewriter, and the document forensic examiners, has been done many times, will prove beyond a doubt in court that this particular typewriter, your honor, typed that ransom note because every typewriter, being a mechanical device, has its own idiosyncrasies and can be identified. Paul, have you, ever, you, been, have you ever been called in as an expert witness in a, in a criminal trial? Oh, no. No, but you, it's very you, rare when yeah. a crime has to do with being proved by the expertise of a typographer. Mm -hmm. A typographer understands full well thousands of typeface, the different designs, that's what I dealt with my whole life for 50 years. But, but, it, but if, there was a, if there was a criminal trial involving fraudulent documents, forgeries, you would qualify as an expert witness. As long as the issue was that the styles of type are different when they shouldn't be. Yes, in that okay. unique case, I'd be qualified. Many others, like, you know, the ransom note was typed, well, the guy proved, well, that, that wouldn't uh, be an area of my expertise. Okay, my now area I, of I, expertise I, is typography. Okay, I, I can remember as a boy um, the Selectric, IBM Selectric typewriter. And yeah, I mean, the removable ball. Yeah, I mean. That if you, typewriter it, was announced the following month before he was born. There couldn't have been one in the office ooh. or, indeed, in the middle of the word student. The typist could have pulled the ball out and put another ball in. But why would they do that? That oh, would wait, be nonsense. Oh, wait a minute. I was starting trying to explain to you how this forgery happened. Well, okay. Obviously how it happened. All right. The reason I'm asking about the IBM Selectric, again, for the younger listeners, this was a revolutionary new typewriter, electric Indeed typewriter. It was. I, had, I had a few of them in my office. It was great. And it had, it had a ball. 
in the center of a round ball in the center that had the the typeset on it and uh, you could if you wanted to change uh, the the fonts and the style of of, of Mm -hmm. type you could take the ball out put another one in uh in other words change the face yeah if you wanted to type all in italics you you put another ball in on the fly you could do that we discussed that in the world net daily article where i acknowledge that there was an existence that announced by IBM the month before, not distributed all over and not in the health department. And certainly government agencies, they're they're like the last to get technology. The last to get this kind of expensive technology it was. Wow. So uh, we were ruling out um, the possibility that for some crazy reason that the government clerk who was typing the baby Obama's birth certificate uh, just felt like I'm going to just keep inter- interchanging yeah. the, the balls no, on the... it can't the, be. It can't be. Another reason it can't be is because my examples of letters that are different, that don't belong there, came from all over the document. And they've been changing between letters. They'd go from... They, they'd have had to pull the ball out and put it in too many times, and it had to be too many balls. How can there be four or five typewriter styles on this document, which there are? How? Paul, then... There's then, only one answer. There is no answer. And it's a simple answer. Then what's the, the answer? The forger. Mm-hmm. In the Hawaiian Department of Health went to the old files, pulled out all the original files that he needed for the era, and he made scans of the letters so he could put them in his software, probably used Adobe Photoshop, and had on hand a whole bunch of letters. And he says, what I'll do now, I'll copy and paste letter by letter from the files, these identical typewriter styles for the era. He was more concerned about, because after all, Dan Rather got kicked out of the business because he used a document to, def- to defame George Bush that was written on a, it was ri- typed on a typewriter that wasn't available at the time they say uh, a military typewriter typed this document about Bush's deficiencies in uh, the National Guard, and it turned out that uh, another expert in typewriters said this type style was not available at that time on military bases. So this document is fraudulent. And there was no, uh, you know, Dan Rather... He lost bumped. his job. He lost his job over that Yeah, issue. And, and, and don't you think the forger was thinking about that? Whoa, i got to get the actual authentic characters. How am I going to do that? Scan the old uh, documents in your file, sir. So uh, he's so, got an assembly of letters stored as a digital file in his computer, and he's copying, pasting letter by letter. He also was aware that when you scan a letter, the scan is really a bunch of little pictures, square pictures put together, and a scan at whatever resolution is going to be uh, identified if you say you, you make a scan of a letter O. You can't take that scan and use it over and over again from that single scan of the letter O. Why? It's because really that O is now described as this when blown up way up as stair steps all the way around the side because they're little black pictures. And exactly where you had that O in the scanner is going to be uh, different every time, every time, microscopically. So he had to scan a number of documents so he could get a letter from a different place every time. People have said, you're wrong, Mr. Irie. The two T's, why would anybody lift a T from another document and not use the same one twice? That's why. They don't want to be caught and convicted for forgery because all the T's on the document were shown to be scanned one time by a scanner. Okay, Paul, that let, would convict them let me, of forgery. Uh, right, that let, isn't the way it would work if you typed up a document and scanned the document. They All the intersection points of the scanning software would be different microscopically for every T on the document. There are nine lowercase T's on the document, by the way, and all of them look different. How can that be? Paul, let me ask you this question. If the forger uh, went through the files of the Hawaii 
um, Department of Health, got all the uh, copies he could get, uh, original uh-huh. uh, birth certificates from 1961. Uh-huh. Why uh-huh. were there different fonts on those birth certificates? Because the forger was not a typographer. The forger said, assumed, well, if I go to the era of 1961 and I scan all the documents around the time that Obama was born that I, we have on file here, I'm going to have all the stuff. See, he was looking for getting that typewriter so much that he assumed if I scan all this stuff and it looked the same to him because he just pulled out the document, he didn't think about could there have been more than one typewriter in use at the time? Or did the documents actually get typed over at the hospital, over this hospital, over at that hospital, and get brought in? He didn't know. All he knew was get the documents from the era, copy them, and then start pulling the letter. I pull the letter T up that comes from one type style in the word student, and I pull another T up that comes from another type style. That's obviously what happened. All right, I, you he know. did not blow them up big enough. Because after all, this is only a typewriter character on a, on a paper. It's very small. And you have to blow it up pretty big to see these type style differences. But I'm familiar with doing that all the time. All right, now, Paul, uh, you know, again, for, for our young listeners to help them grasp what we're saying here, they have to understand the mentality uh, of, of, the, of that era. Um, you know, my first radio job in 19, let's see, 1976, okay, um, you know, I'm hired as a salesman, advertising salesman at, at a radio. It, and it was, this is going to be hard for the, for the younger listeners. It was the first FM radio station on the air in my city. First FM. There was no FM, folks. I mean, the older people uh-huh. remember this, uh-huh. okay? But what did the radio station do? They didn't want to put a lot of money into this new startup, so they gave us all of the, basically the junk f- from the AM station, okay? Uh-huh. So our equipment in the studios, uh, our offices, it was all the junk that came from the AM station, which was the money-making part of the business. So the typewriter I had to work with, I, you know, only God knows when that thing was made. I mean, it was an ancient thing. What I'm trying to say is, in 1961, in the little state of Hawaii, out in the Pacific, those clerks in the office may have been typing on typewriters that had been acquired from the U.S. Army after World War II. Uh-huh. Right? Is that correct? Uh-huh. I mean, they uh-huh. would have had really old typewriters. Of course. So, so this, forger, this forger wasn't thinking like this. No, he was just thinking, he's, he's not, now we're in a digital age, and he's thinking digital. Scan, copy and paste, all digital work, Photoshop, which I'm very familiar with, too. I span this era where the technology's changed rapidly, but I, I had to keep up with him to be in the business. To uh, make any money in this country in the last 40 years, and, and you, told you me- had to adopt the, the new technology as soon as possible and, and exploit it to the max. Ask Steve Jobs, ask Bill Gates, ask you, John you, Warnock. Yeah, you told, you told me off the air that, that you remember the founder of, of Adobe. Uh, uh, John Warnock. John, yeah, when a you, by himself you remember when he was the just... the first a- Mac World show he attended uh-huh. with his uh, booth selling his uh, typefaces. Oh, yeah. Uh, he's a billionaire today mm-hmm. because but, he did amazing innovations as a uh, computer professor in the University of Utah. He designed a map, so, so, a program to write to make maps. So when did you, when did you first be uh, PostScript, the language that was adopted to develop documentation? Xerox was working on it, but they didn't exploit it. When Steve Jobs saw what Xerox was doing, a, a newsletter guru took him over to show him. He went back and told his people who were then on the Apple II, making Apple IIs, this is amazing, insane uh, technology, work on it, and come up with the first Macintosh, which I bought Paul, <laughs> right Paul, away when you, when... and exploited in my business. I came to the point where I was doing four-color process stripping of a four-color circular we did, mm-hmm. and saving 
$5,000 per issue because we had no stripping costs. We mm -hmm. had no tables set up with big sheets of film where you had to strip in all the tints oh, yeah. and tones uh, to create the four-color process printing. I remember those days. I was the first days. one to do that, to take a Mac Plus with a large screen that I had bought and produce files. It wasn't even a color computer, but I was able to produce files that ran off a linotype type, film typesetter that I could take that film to the printer. You were the first to do that directly. process. You were the first That's person. The kinds of things I did that were innovative. Nobody had done that before. So you were the first person to do that process with a Mac. Yes, to take a Macintosh. I was the first person to take a Macintosh and go do professional four-color process printing with the files all coming except for the photography, and that we did later with Adobe Photoshop. There's a release in 1989. Right. When Adobe Photoshop was released in 1989, December, well, it wasn't released then. I got a beta test from my dealer. It was The manual was only 12 typewritten pages. That was the beginning of Adobe Photoshop, which is now the premier program everybody uses in graphic arts. Paul, I started with that uh, before anybody else and exploited it. And any money I made in business was because I was exploiting the latest technology and quickly abandoning the old type technology. But I understood the old technology. Mm -hmm. As I say, a, a typist, a, a secretary, could have discovered this if she could have, if she knew Adobe Photoshop, because she'd import the file, as I did from the Associated Press, blow it up big on her screen, and say like I did, bingo. All right, uh, Jerry. Type Jerry, styles are different. Uh, uh, Jerry, Why? Even if you're not a typographer, you can plainly see at the World Net Daily article that the styles of type are different. I got cap S's that are wider than some others. I got... Uh, Cap R that's taller and narrower than another, and it goes on and on. I can read them off the screen, but I advise people to okay. go to WND.com and look for the proof for the typographer story right, now I've got and a, see I, for themselves. Paul, I have, it up, I have it in front of me right now, and I think you're referring to Exhibit 2 in Dr. Corsi's article uh, where uh -huh. it says... Um, uh, Mr. Irie extracted individual type letters and prepared a chart listing each type letter in the right, document right. seen in Exhibit 2. It says, now this is in caps, Barack Hussein Obama, comma, second, two, mail, August 4, 1961, 724P, Hallelujah, Kapalani uh, Maternity, Ghana. Well, you're looking at the uh, all letters. Uh, what I did is I scanned... All got the best copy I could scan off Associated Press release. Mm -hmm. I scanned all the type on the document, and then I copied and pasted it into a tighter page, but still everything in order the way it was on the document. Mm -hmm. And then I put numbers in red from 1 to um, 144. As I recall, the last all the letters are identified now by count. Oh, you're up into 200. I showed my yeah. two-letter examples. I kept the... Uh, number, the red little red number underneath, with that example so people could see where it came from on okay. the document. Okay, you have numbers up to over 260-something, so what does that represent? The number of letters, typewritten letters, on the document. Okay. Arranged on one page as uh, an identifier, a reference for where my examples came from. Okay. So people say, well, I see your R. Where did that come from? That's not proof to me unless I see what part it came from. Right, okay. So, so they look at the number underneath, and that helps them find the first file all letters. They identify it there. So an, exp an experienced person looking at these um, letters, what, what are they seeing in this, in this document? Well, uh, in the examples of the proof, where I put two letters together and say that they're different, what I hope they're seeing is that... Uh, they appear to be different shapes and style of letters, that some are taller than others. I've got a lowercase two, I mean, a number two, for example, mm -hmm. where uh, there's only two number twos on the Obama birth certificate. Mm -hmm. One of them is obviously wider than the other. 
Okay, I think we got uh, Paul back on the line here. Paul, we lost you there for a few uh, seconds there. Uh, let's pick up what we what we were talking about before we lost the phone call. I was asking you the questions here about the examples you that are on Dr. Corsi's article. Yeah. You were showing um, you 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 gave a number, a numerical uh, value or a numerical uh, identification. Each letter. Yes, you numbered each letter that was on the birth certificate, and then you right. show. You show you take the same letters that appear multiple times in the birth certificate, mm-hmm. and you put them together side by side, and now we see they're different. Yes, and that can't yes. be. That's right. It can't be. I'm looking exactly. at it right now. There's three. there's one, yes. two, three, yes. four, five, six, six different A's on the birth certificate. Uh huh. Why would anybody type? Six different fonts on a on a single page document. No, it's not going to happen. That's why I say I concluded that the forger had just used multiple old documents, but didn't realize that there was not they not worked for the same typewriter. So the forger the forger is a whiz in uh, Photoshop. Yeah, but, graphic arts and stuff, but, but not a whiz as a typographer. He probably never understood that there could be differences in typewriter styles. I wonder if this man or woman uh, understands that he could become a felon and go to oh, yeah, prison. He charged, it's a class uh, It's a class B felony in Hawaii. Uh, there's no class of felonies for federal. They face all kinds of charges. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know that uh, President Obama didn't do this forgery. And uh, I have to assume that though he was aware that something was made up, let's face it, he fought releasing it for three years. And court challenges didn't get it out of him. And then suddenly, due to pressure from the upcoming book of Corsi and Donald Trump's statements to the press, he felt he just had to have something out there. Yeah, well, Originally, you know, Richard, Richard Nixon didn't pry open the door at the Watergate building. Right, but, right. But the, the plumbers did it, and uh, right. it brought down his presidency. That's correct. And so and, so we've got here, we have uh, we have something far greater as far as a scandal than, than Watergate. We have the President of the United States using the official White House website to say this image of this document is legitimate. Right. He should know that it's not. I think the basic problem is, is he can't really come up with a birth certificate from any hospital in America, including, including Copliani. And this health department record allows them to have a path where they can control those people and tell them what to do. And they, apparently they prepared that in that office. And I think that's where the forger works. He would have to have uh, full access to the files that are only there. They can't be removed. The binders shouldn't even be open. I don't know how he opened it. He probably didn't open it. He probably put the binder face down on his uh, scanner. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean the, the forger works for the Department of Health. It could also mean that the, that the Department of Health has a mole inside the agency that gave access to the forger to these well, files. Somebody had to go into the Department of Health That's and, right. and scan on a scanning machine, not a copier. So there are people... A, a lot of background, a lot of letters. Okay, there's a way that could have happened. Uh, somebody would have, uh, a mole would have made... Uh, direct copies on their copy machine and taken the printed copies and handed them over to the forger who did the work on computer in his home. That's always possible. But that uh, worker inside, the mole inside, would have been uh, an accomplice. So th- there is a there is a cover-up that involves oh, yeah. people inside the Hawaii Department of Health. Oh, yeah. Well, you don't know the story. Didn't Corsi tell that story? I'll let him tell that story. Oh, he's he's been on here a number of times. Which story are you talking about? Oh, the story about the mole in the uh, oh yeah yeah health department. Yeah, who told him that it absolutely is fake? Right, right. Uh, called him and said we don't have anything in the beginning. Six months ago, nothing in the files. Mm-hmm. Then the mole calls him and said suddenly there's something in the files, and it's going to be released soon. I think that mole knows who the forger is, and my best guess is 
the forager was in the health department. They didn't want to get that let let that out of the health department at any time. Keep all the records there. The only thing they wanted to release was the uh, phony document that they put in the binder by now. Now, uh, Paul, um, this article written by Dr. Corsi is on the internet. The whole world can access it. That's true. Um, clearly. Uh, it, it's visible for law enforcement agencies to see. Has anybody oh, yeah. from any federal agency contacted you? No. Nor media. No and media I, has I contacted I you. Expect, I don't expect them to. But, but the FBI has not contacted you? No. Immigration, Social Security, the, the Hawaii Department of Health, no one has contacted you? Well, you know, you have to contact them when you're uh, going to report a crime, and I will. But, but uh, you're Mr. out there. Mr. Volk prepared a very good presentation. It's on his select website, and he submitted that. It's up on Scrib. It's a legal website, and he submitted that to the FBI, and is, the FBI is well aware of his findings. Who is and this? They'll soon be aware of mine. Who are you referring to? Volk, V O G T. Oh, yes, okay. You know who he is. Yes. You All right. Interview him. I talked to him yesterday for a couple hours. So you're going to you're going to um, you're going to sign a, a, a legal affidavit saying uh, uh-huh. it is my expert opinion that this document is a forgery. Yes, I've already done that, and I'm sending it today by Federal Express to Orly Tates. Yes, Orly Tates claims she has a judge waiting to see it. Mm-hmm. I don't know what the case is, but it'll, it'll probably develop uh, what what's the result. I would hope the judge would look at it and say, can't we get a state forensic document examiner to look at this birth certificate and tell us what they think so we have, because I believe a forensic document examiner certified should be the one to make this kind of decision as far as court's concerned. Yes, if if a grand jury uh, subpoenaed you uh, and a federal prosecutor, you would testify. Absolutely. Listen, I'm happy that I'm the only one to have noticed that the typewriter styles don't match and exposing this fraud. That's why there's no question in my mind that it's a fraudulent document. People that are not familiar with typography, not familiar with typewriters, experts commented below my story at World Net Daily. And if they said they had any experience at all in graphic arts or typesetting, type typography, or uh, uh, there was people that sold and dealt with typewriters, all agree. They all agree. I've never seen a typewriter do this kind of thing. I think you're right. That sort of comment. Distra- dist- distractors will pick out things like, I drew a red line on the A. And I shouldn't have even done that. And I didn't even want them to print that page, but... The, the, the lines should have been closer in uh, in an arrangement. She accused me of being off by one pixel, and and it was a deliberate attempt to mislead the public because my red line is off by one pixel. That's a one pixel crime. One pixel is pretty small, <laughs> and that was her best criticism. And she hung her hat on that and report, he reported uh, put it posted on every page in uh, the comment section of my article, what a bad guy I was because I'm trying to mislead you. My red lines don't, never, ever attempting to look, well, look at those two ways and say, hey, one is wider than the other. One is 90% narrower than the other. Notice that. That, by definition, makes the angle of the A different. But she don't want to talk about that. She won't bring it up because some people, they just go in determined to say things that sound good to make your document uh, examination seem fraudulent. And then they call you all kinds of names. I'm a racist at one site. Oh, a definite racist. Mm-hmm. That's the only reason I'd ever do anything like this, is I just don't want a black president. And then well, they tell me at the end, well, you're going to have to live with it for another four years. This isn't the issue at all. No, I don't like to be lied to. I want my president to show us his birth certificate damn fast. And the one from the hospital. Copliani was required by law, as every hospital in the United States and its territories has always been, to issue documentation to prove the birth. The Dr. Sinclair that's on this document, he's dead. 
Hello. Yeah, you're there. You're there. But he's the, dead. Uh, I'd but, like to see his hospital records. But and, and to Paul, verify. Paul, his huh? his his family did not know he delivered Barack yeah, Obama. Yeah, they had to. Uh, yeah, of course. This is all. This is all a lie. The forger picked up a signature from another. Uh, probably it could be found in the health department. That signature on another. You know, signatures could be identified as being too exact and same. Somewhere, uh, Dr. Sinclair signed a birth certificate, and that was lifted. That's all they needed. On. Well, Paul, uh, I wish I had some more time. We we're out of time. And, and what yeah. I want to say again on the air, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying this with all seriousness and sincerity, uh, to the FBI, uh, to um, Get in touch with me. Social Security Administration, to intelligence agencies, the all of the um, intelligence agencies in, in the United States that are supposed to be protecting our national security. Why are you afraid to investigate this fraud? Where uh-huh. are the federal agents? Why aren't uh-huh. you interviewing men like Paul Irie? Why aren't you going to the people who have expert analysis of this document? Washington is complicit with this cover-up, and it goes to the very top. It goes through the, all of the agencies, and this is a scandal beyond comprehension. That the, oh, yeah, biggest scandal ever. It is the corruption goes to the very core of our government through all of the agencies, and it's going to require the American people to tell these government agents, you work for us, and we can get rid of you. You work for us. We don't work for yeah. you. Oh yeah. And and if we we're going to prove one way or the other, not only that this man is a liar, but when the lid finally comes off, I want these I want these bums that are covering up for him to know you're going to be exposed too. All of uh-huh. you are going uh-huh. to get exposed. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. The lid's going to be pulled answer. back, and all the Judges maggots are going to be answer. seen. Yes, sir. Judges should have to answer for some of their decisions. That's right. That's right. Well, my guest today, Paul Irie, uh, long, long professional history uh, in in print, uh, in advertising, in graphic arts. Uh, the man has the expert knowledge to to help get a conviction on whoever forged this document. And um, again, I'm challenging the FBI. Go see this man. Don't sit on your at your desk in Washington. Get out there and interview this man and find out why he claims this is a forgery. And and I'm going to stay on this until somebody does it. Paul, thank you. God bless you. Appreciate you coming on True News today. You're welcome, sir, and I'll come back anytime. All right. The only people who don't want to disclose the truth are people with something to hide.